So good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in our careers in genetics and genomics. We hope to share with you from individuals who are working in these different capacities to shed light on their career and their career path. So we hope that you are able to stick with us. And at the end, we would like you to complete a survey. We'll provide the survey throughout the hour, but please, before you log off, complete the survey for us. We appreciate that. Thank you. So we are, okay, here we go. Well, I'm Deborah Murray, and I'm a co-director in the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity in the Molecular Human Genetics Department at Baylor College of Medicine. This is the front of Baylor. If you've never been to Baylor College of Medicine, we welcome you. Please come to Houston, and we can give you a tour of the um, institution as well as our department and hope that uh, there is something here that will bring you back. And so there are several training programs that Baylor offers and just listed a few here. But if you're interested in any of the specific career types that were mentioned today, and please, please reach out and we will share information with you as well as the speakers are willing to talk with you. So there's a master's in genetic counseling program and there's a PhD in genetics and genomics. So these are out of our department. And if you're in medical school, there is a track for medical students, the genetics and genomics pathway, and we'll have someone talk about that later. And also beyond the um, uh, training, there are opportunities for fellowships in medical genetics residency and clinical laboratory fellowship program and postdoctoral training as well. And we also have a medical genetics diversity visiting students program for the senior, well, not seniors, but your fourth year in medical school, and you want to uh, do a rotation. We do have that for underrepresented groups. And so we will start with Dr. Sharon Plon. Hi. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm the oldest, so they gave me a little bit more time because my career is the longest. Uh, so I'm now a professor here in both genetics and pediatric oncology. So I'm gonna, gonna quickly go through a career path just to mainly tell you folks that it doesn't all work out the way you think it will, um, but and that your family life can continue while you're going on. But when I started in genetics, we did one gene at a time, as I'll show you over a long period of time, and now I can look at exome results on my cell phone. So, you know, some people have very straight and narrow career paths. Mine looked more like a highway intersection in Houston. And so as an undergraduate, I switched majors from chemical engineering to chemistry. I only decided to go to medical school very late. So I did my biology, freshman biology as a senior. I always love to travel, I still do. I'm going to Europe again in two weeks and I went alone in Europe for four months. That had been a lifetime dream uh, before I started an MD PhD program at Harvard. And so I was originally in biophysics but I wound up doing genetics work. So one thing, cause many of you are different phases of your research career is I do think it's important uh, and this was my PhD mentor to be experimentally aggressive. So don't shy away from hard experiments. Um, Dr. Wong, uh, James Wong recommended something that in the end with a lot of hard work although it seemed like a crazy idea at the time we were able to publish um, for my thesis work. Uh, but then I had to decide what to do because I was in an MD-PhD program. And you'll hear from some others in different kinds of training. I, in medical school, you match. And I matched originally in internal medicine, thinking I was going to do cancer. Um, and I enjoyed medicine, but I really miss research. So I, again, took one of those highway detours, and I took a leave of absence. And I wanted to do more research and decide what I wanted to do. So my husband and I moved from Seattle to uh, Bethesda and uh, went to the National Cancer Institute and he uh, worked in a different lab and for a research fellowship. So 
you know, you can have good and th bad things happen at the same time. So I took on, I was experimentally aggressive. I took on a big topic, a whole new screen. And my mentor started traveling a lot. And I discovered the reason why he was traveling was because even though I'd only been there a year, he actually took a new position, left the NCI to go work at a cancer center in California. And I was left uh, to finish the project on my own and wound up with one tiny paper because we never could do sort of the ambitious experiments we wanted. But that was actually the same year that my first child was born. Uh, this is my son as a newborn. So we were heading back to Seattle, and this is where serendipity totally came into play. I didn't know medical genetics uh, existed as a field, and I wound up talking to George Stamianopoulos about doing a second postdoc. Turned out he ran, he was the chief of medical genetics. And he literally said to me, young lady, you should do genetics, you can still do medicine, uh, it's not as busy as oncology, and you can still do research. And that's actually how I became a medical geneticist. I won't talk about the path in detail. You'll hear about that from more current people because the training was actually slightly different then. But I went back to Seattle and did a medical genetics fellowship. So my board certifications in clinical genetics. Um, I became board certified in medical genetics and I was still doing very basic research. So I was looking at yeast as a model system for human cancer. I got some funding. And then again, you know, family plays an important role. My husband had made a commitment to be a pediatric surgeon. There are only 30 training slots in the U.S., and it's a match. So we looked for cities that were good in pediatric surgery and medical genetics, and that's how we wound up here. So my husband matched to Texas Children's, and I was recruited by David Poplack. That's me in my brand new lab um, as he was developing the Children's Cancer Center. And so again, I continue to do yeast genetics, but I was now a medical geneticist and it seemed to make sense to make my clinical work more relevant to my laboratory research. And then I was asked to see these interesting children. Actually, sadly, they both now died uh, as young children. They had a very rare condition called Rothman-Thompson syndrome, but they also had bone cancer. And when I looked up this condition, it wasn't clear that people knew it was associated with bone cancer. So I put together a research team, and that's my other piece of advice, work with people you like. Baylor is a great place. We had all these experts in different specialties related to this rare disorder. And I had a young fellow in my lab who was interested in bone cancer. So she took this on. And now almost 20 years ago, we published this paper that showed there were two kinds of Rothman-Thompson syndrome and mutations in this gene were associated with a very high risk of bone cancer. It actually took almost 20 years to find the other gene. These 10 patients didn't have a mutation in the gene. And last year, uh, a group collaborating with Lisa and me, and Brendan actually, and me playing a tiny role, actually found the second gene. So it's also using exome sequencing. So it's also important to realize that something that may seem straightforward can still take a very long time. So, the other thing I think about when I think about my career is I think about family transitions. So this is my daughter graduating from college. So now both of my kids have graduated. And this is also around the time I got involved in the Genome Center. And this is when clinical exome sequencing became possible. And again, I was involved in a very large team here at Baylor that developed the first test where you could take a patient's blood and sequence all of their genes and report it back to their physicians. And these couple of years from 2011 to 2014 were just incredibly exciting. We published a whole series of papers on the development of that test, which still plays a very important role in diagnosis of genetic conditions around the country. But I was interested in cancer. And so we put a different team of people together, overlapping with that group, to say, could we do this in childhood cancer patients? And we published a study called Basic 3. And then in 2020, we expanded it. This was a meeting right before the pandemic, where a group now of six different centers around the country all working together to see, could we apply genomics to pediatric cancer patients and improve their care? So to sort of sum, sum up, because I know you got a lot of people on the panel, I think it's important to take on challenging projects and careers. 
Genetics constantly grows with new areas of research as you advance in your career. So you're not always doing the same thing. Again, I went from yeast to single genes to exomes and genomes. The MD-PhD pathway or physician scientist pathway has been really important. These individuals often to become leaders of these large teams of physicians and scientists, and you can serve as a bridge between otherwise separate uh, worlds. Work with collaborators you enjoy. That's an incredibly important piece of advice. And your family can grow and prosper while you do. And this was us more recently at a trip in California. And uh, happy if there's time at the end to take questions. But I know there are lots of other people to talk about their story. All right. Thank you, Dr. Plun. Up next is Dr. April Adams. Um, so good afternoon. I'm April Adams. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my path to becoming a reproductive geneticist. Um, so when I, I actually said when I was about six years old, someone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said that I wanted to be an obstetrician. And their response to me was that um, they actually laughed at me and said that I probably didn't know what an obstetrician was. And so that was my, the beginning of my journey to becoming an obstetrician. <laughs> um, and then after that, I kind of went on through the whole um, normal path of high school, college, med school, all of those things. And along the way, had lots of people actually, probably until I got to fellowship, consistently tell me that the goals that I was setting maybe were too high and I should probably think about goals that were a little bit easier to attain. So my first piece of advice is if you really want something and you think you can do it and somebody says no, then ask someone else. <laughs> so, um, so the next slide, I will go a little bit through my training. So I um, went to undergrad at Purdue University uh, in Indiana, um, and I studied uh, biology there, and I went in as a pre-med um, because, I, uh, as I said before, I wanted to go to medical school. And then during my um, time there, I was able to start working in a lab that did our research on rats, and we did um, some interesting things, which kind of made me think, oh, do I want to actually do research instead? And I kind of was kind of going back and forth about some different things. And then during my senior year of undergrad, I took some um, genetics courses and realized that this has to be the coolest thing ever. So I was like, okay, actually, I want to be a geneticist, but I don't want to give up on medicine. And at the time, I really didn't know what you did as a clinical geneticist. I had no idea that that was a real job or what would happen. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to get a PhD and go down the research route. And so, um, but I didn't do that because I still wanted to go to medical school. And so then I was really fortunate to find this program at Tulane University at the time to, that was a, a human genetics master's program. And you really got to do a mix of one, um, working with um, medical geneticists from different fields, genetic counselors, um, as well as working in lab. And so getting to see that full picture. Um, but the one obstacle I had, because as um, uh, Dr. Pond mentioned, nothing ever goes in a quite the right direction you think it's going to go in, was that I got really excited. I'm going to go to this program. I'm graduating from undergrad. I'm going to figure out my whole life. Um, I found an apartment in New Orleans and I was gonna move in there. And then my flight was supposed to leave on August 21st. And so you may be familiar with an, a big event that happened in New Orleans on August 23rd, 2005. So that was when Hurricane Katrina hit. And so I was like, oh goodness, what am I gonna do with myself now? Because I'm clearly not moving to New Orleans this weekend. Um, so, <laughs> so I had a little bit of a derailment there, but then was able to kind of get back and I got to return to New Orleans during a lot of the recovery phase um, and then learned that not only did I want to do genetics and figure out how I could be a doctor that practiced genetics, I also found out that I really was interested in health equity and health disparities and what happens to people when they don't have access to the care they need. So even though that was a very traumatic, like, okay, what do I do with my life at this point? I really found out something else about my interests during that period. And so then I left there 
And actually, sorry, during that time, I also found out about the specialty that I'm currently in, which is maternal fetal medicine and genetics. I met the first person I knew that did that specialty and kind of, okay, this is something I can, I have a career path now. So I'm going to go down this road. Um, so then I went to medical school at Wayne State University. Um, and it was uh, mostly uneventful. And then I did my residency at the University of Minnesota. Um, and then I spent a long time during residency figuring out how do I find a training program for maternal fetal medicine and genetics, which was really difficult at the time because it was like all over the place. Some programs were closed, some were open. And so I really spent a lot of time finding this mentorship and figuring out, okay, how do I find a program? Um, and in the end, I ended up at um, in DC um, at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and then also at the NIH. And I will say that that probably was like the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I really got to see the intersection between research and medicine um, and really figure out, okay, how do I make this career what I want it to be? And so um, that brings me to where I am now. Um, that um, so right now I'm currently um, an assistant professor. I'm in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, as a maternal fetal medicine physician, but I also work in the Department of um, Molecular and Human Genetics as well. Um, and I do mostly prenatal genetics, but I also see um, uh, women who have uh, genetic conditions as well in the preconception period or during their pregnancy. And so I get to kind of do this full spectrum of care, but also incorporate that into women's health. Um, additionally, I um, am the medical maternal medical director at Ben Top Hospital. So I get to add that piece of providing um, care to women who are from underserved populations, as well as learn more about how can we improve health equity and decrease some of the disparities that we see. Um, you get to see lots in the media about health disparities and health equity um, issues with kind of regular medical conditions, but it's something that does exist in the realm of um, genetics and specifically in reproductive genetics. And I think that I'm excited to get to be on the ground to really try to make some difference there. Um, and then the last piece that I get to do is work with trainees as part of our fellowship program. And so if you may have a question about, okay, what is reproductive genetics? And I alluded to it a little bit, um, that it's really just looking at the kind of a whole women's health from that perspective of how do these genetic conditions impact you. Um, and so um, that's really kind of what I do day to day. Um, it's been a, definitely a, a fun and interesting journey and I hope just continue learning. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Next up is Dr. Joshua White. Okay, um, well, I guess if anything, you're gonna get a continuation of the theme that the path is not linear. So uh, I grew up in Ohio and uh, right here in Columbus, you know, when I was in high school, science was not on my mind. Wrestling was, and that's what I went to college for. Like, literally, I was not thinking about science or this career path at all. Um, but sh So I went to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, about two and a half hours away from where I grew up uh, for a scholarship there to wrestle. But shortly after I started, um, we had a Title IX lawsuit, and we actually lost our men's wrestling team and to make room, for, as well as a few other men's sports teams, uh, to make room for some women's teams in sports. So I had to find a job. And at this time, I was uh, pursuing a degree in environmental law. And I really wasn't interested in science, per se, uh, more so in actually conservation. But I needed money. And this guy right here, uh, John Kiss on the far left, he needed someone to wash dishes and uh, work in his lab. So I started working for him. And he had a lot of money from NASA for plant research and biochemistry. So I started working there and shortly thereafter, they uh, encouraged me to apply for a Hughes Foundation summer internship to basically work in a lab full time. And I did that and that really changed my career trajectory uh, directly from that point. And then I wanted to go into industry to make some money and pay for college. And so I was gonna work for Procter & Gamble, which is a big chemical company in Cincinnati. But uh, towards December, they actually had a giant stock crash. So they put all hiring on freeze my job 
disappeared. And I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> so it was uh, definitely a panicked moment. But thankfully, I had a great academic advisor. This is his name, or this is a picture of Ken Wilson. And he encouraged me to apply for PhD programs. He's like, given your research experience, you know, you probably would enjoy it. It's like, all right, you know, I did enjoy the time in the lab. So he had gone to University of Utah, and that was one of the schools I applied to. And long story short, I ended up going there for uh, graduate school. So I made the journey to Salt Lake, and it was fantastic. There I worked for Dean Lee, who's now the head of uh, Merck Research Laboratories. And the topics that I worked on in this lab were predominantly related to um, blood vessels. So here's arteries and there's veins. And normally you have uh, this capillary interface where oxygenation of tissue happens. And something that Dean had developed mouse models for at the time were this disease of uh, called HHT or hereditary hemorrhagic injectasia, where vessels shunt together and they lack this capillary bed. And it's basically like a ticking time bomb because vessels are prone to rupture. And this is kind of an example of what it would look like in patients. So uh, I really was interested in vascular biology after working with Dean. And for my postdoc, I went further west uh, to UCSF. And I worked with uh, these two guys, Deepak Srivastava and Benoit Bruno, to study whole orm syndrome, which is also known as hand-heart syndrome, because they have upper limb uh, abnormalities in those patients, as well as holes in the heart or between the septa. And so we worked on some mouse models and transcriptional regulations process. It was also a great place to live in Oakland and San Francisco. It's fantastic. Um, there I was able to meet my wife, and we started a process of adoption. And it was a really good time to be a postdoc and be able to be free to creative and do whatever you want to study in all honesty. So towards the end of my postdoc, I had a job offer at a company um, that Deepak sat on the board of, uh, Berkeley Lights. And I was also interested still in, because I had some scientific questions I still wanted to answer. And that was a hard decision to decide between industry or academia. But obviously I ended up choosing academia and I took a job here at Baylor College of Medicine in 2014 and started my lab. So briefly, like what we work on is uh, the vasculature. So whether you're in the liver, pancreas, brain, any tissue, there's really vascular invasion in all of them. And no cell is more than about 15 to uh, 50 microns away from blood vessel. Um, this is really true when you look at like this cross section of the heart or this micro CT of the mouse lung where all the blood vessels are labeled and you can appreciate just how well invaginated both these tissues are with the vessels. Uh, we use systems like zebrafish. This is the head and the tail. And you can see in this movie where blood cells are actually labeled with red fluorescent protein, that this is a great surrogate for vascular development and function in vivo. We also use mice in a lot of 2D and 3D high resolution imaging, which we do right here uh, in the cores of Baylor. So this is an early mouse embryo right here where the heart's labeled. This are neurons in the brain. This is the blood vessels in the brain, which is really a high point of interest for us. And this kind of imaging is stuff that you can do when you're in graduate school here, because all these technologies are freely available at Baylor. We do a lot of work on glioma, a particular brain cancer, where we can take mice and knock out a few tumor suppressors. And then we uh, electroporate them with these constructs and they grow up and develop brain tumors. We're interested in how the blood vessels and uh, tumor cells interact. So this seems to be really important in uh, glioma disease progression. And many of these patients actually die from hemorrhage deregulation in the brain. So you can see here, this 3D imaging where the tumor cells are labeled in green, the blood vessels are in gray. So again, we're fairly interested in these processes. We've also gone back to that initial topic that I went to graduate school for, which is arteriovenous malformations. So we identified the first uh, somatic mutations that occur in patients in a paper in the journal a few years ago. And here you can see when you gain this particular gene KRAS function, you get these large shunts and those tortuous vessels there. And again, these are um, just a 3D imaging of them. These are very prone to rupture and leak in the brain. So very interesting to us. So as far as things that I wish I would have known before uh, when I was in your shoes, if you're an undergrad, is I didn't know, because no one in my family had done a PhD, that you could actually get paid to go to school and uh, your tuition would be covered. Like this was completely news to me when I was thinking about graduate school. Um, some other advice I would give you guys is don't sell yourself short if you think you're unqualified, right? Like let somebody else make that decision. If you're interested, kind of like uh, what Dr. Adams said, apply. Like just, you never know what they're looking for, right? Uh, grad schools often take a holistic approach, including GPA research experience and also yearly improvements. Just because your total GPA is not what you think it should be or what they say their average is, 
if each year if it's climbing and getting better, they weigh that and they look at that. And I can say that having been on the different admissions committees here at Baylor and use that. You can use those strengths, find other research experiences. If you're already doing things like the great and smart programs here at Baylor or other schools, those all look good. Get those letter writers, you know, to really know you and be personal. Um, finally, when you do have that decision of where to go and what to do in your career, go where you're supported. Don't go where you feel like you have to justify your existence because inevitably something's going to go wrong or change and you want to go where you know that they have your back and they uh, are really on your side. Uh, there's lots of smart people in science and indeed in any careers. You can really stand out by being reliable and hardworking. And if you're interested in research and running a lab, definitely work on your writing skills and reading the literature. There's demand for scientists with coding and programming skills. So if you can get any exposure to those, either through school or through extension courses, I would recommend it. And finally, uh, you don't need a PhD um, to be a scientist and contribute to biomedical research. And, you know, you can really get into the workforce early and immediately, especially if you're fat, financial or family concerns, and you can contribute meaningfully in industry and in academic research without actually going to graduate school. If that's, you know, you have to put it on hold, that's okay too, right? And also for everybody, especially I think, um, you know, for many of us who are younger, you can talk about this with our parents, like there's real value in learning about the cost benefits of going into debt for school versus other things and decisions. And this is a great book that's super simple to comprehend uh, about finances. Um, and if you have any questions about these things, I have a lot of links on my lab webpage where you can go to for career advice and other stuff like that. And I will stop. All right, thank you. That was just fascinating. So our next speaker, Abigail Yeso. Right. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So my name is Abigail Yeso. I'm a genetic counselor at Texas Children's Hospital in the Texas, Texas Children's Heart Center. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about my career path, but also generally talking about the genetic counseling profession. Um, next slide, please. So um, I started off my career uh, by graduating from Tulane University in 2016. My bachelor's is in public health and tropical medicine and English, uh, which are not even remotely related to what I do now, but um, they created a foundation for me in sort of exploring professions in healthcare um, that allowed as patient-centered of an approach as possible. Um, I'd like to credit my interest in genetic counseling actually with a, a medical anthropology course that I took my senior year. Um, which focused on different approaches to care and how we can incorporate the patient explanatory model as effectively as possible. And so after sort of discovering genetic counseling through that class, I decided to pursue a master's degree in genetics and genomics at Tulane University. Um, I studied there for a year and essentially completed a degree in human genetics uh, with a combination of clinical coursework, clinical rotations, um, and it gave me a broad overview of the genetics profession overall. Uh, from there, Rather than applying to school right away, I wanted to get some experience working in the field. So I moved up to Chicago and worked in a pre-implantation genetic testing laboratory as their intake coordinator for some time. Um, there, I was able to interact directly with patients and get a sense of you know, what sort of anxieties they had about genetic testing, about genetic testing technologies and things like that. And from there, you know, I felt adequately prepared to apply for genetic counseling programs. And I was admitted to Baylor College of Medicine shortly thereafter. I graduated in 2021. Um, with a degree in genetic counseling. And ever since then, I've been working as a cardiovascular genetic counselor here at Texas Children's Hospital. I think that looking back on sort of my career trajectory, overall, I had a central goal in mind. I knew I wanted to be in a field that involved the, the scientific aspect of education, but wasn't necessarily um, as specialized as a physician. I wanted to be able to interact with patients in a way that tailored education to them directly. And I wanted to be able to communicate really complex um, topics in a way that was approachable and digestible for patients. Uh, next slide, please. So briefly, I know that when I was your age, I actually had uh, no idea what genetic counseling even was. So I figured I'd give you guys kind of a brief overview. Um, uh, next slide, please. 
basically genetic counseling is just the process of helping people to understand and adapt to medical, psychological, and familial implications Mm -hmm. of the genetic contributions to disease. In order to perform genetic counseling, you don't actually have to be a genetic counselor, but our training is specialized for this process. Um, There are physicians who are excellent genetic counselors. Um, There are nurses and nurse coordinators who are also excellent genetic counselors. But part of our job is to sort of take the the weight off of those individuals for this sort of specialized process. Next slide, please. So part of our job um, entails not only the interpretation of a family and medical history, looking to see you know, what the the risk of a a disease occurring again in the future would be, but also educating about the actual genetic results, talking about inheritance patterns, testing, the management of certain conditions, um, preventing certain conditions and required screening, and then also providing resources for families, connecting them with resource. So really just a really broad scope um, as far as what we, we are able to do in a clinical setting. We also counsel regarding informed choices for families. So making sure that whenever they are interested in pursuing things like genetic testing, understanding the consent process, understanding um, you know, what the possible implications of a positive or negative result might be. Next slide, please. And so now that I've told you a little bit about sort of what we are, we can talk a bit about what we do. Um, Genetic counselors can be very specialized or work in much more general settings. So uh, individuals who are hyper-specialized like myself tend to work in one setting and focus on one sort of disease category, but genetic counselors can work in a prenatal setting with pediatric patients, adult patients, or may not even see patients at all and work in a laboratory or research setting. Our job looks vastly different depending on what specialty you're focusing on. And that's part of the reason that I wanted to make my presentation a bit more general today, because my specialty, which is inherited cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias looks vastly different from other genetic counselors. We also have uh, many different roles and responsibilities within a clinical and laboratory setting. So in addition to educating individuals on the inheritance of genetic disease, we're also responsible for collecting a family health history through something called a pedigree um, and providing a, a risk assessment based on what we think their likelihood of a heritable genetic disease would be based on that family history. Perhaps the most unique aspect of our job is providing the psychosocial support and counseling to individuals. We ourselves are not licensed um, psychological counselors, but we're trained in ways to help individuals process the extra weight that a genetic diagnosis may have. And so some of you may be asking, how do I even find these programs? How do I become interested in being a genetic counselor? And so I want to kind of walk you through the basics of that. Um, first step is something that most of us uh, most of us have all completed, which is just a, a bachelor's degree with the required prerequisites, which I detailed on our next slides. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the application process is fairly simple after completing the prerequisites and similar to um, The medical school process, the genetic counseling schools now use a match program, meaning that uh, once you've submitted an application, you'll then go on to complete an interview and then be matched with programs based on a ranking system. From there, once you complete your degree, clinical hours, and in most cases, defend a thesis, um, you'll graduate from your program typically within two years. Um, And then upon graduation, it's expected that individuals who want to practice as genetic counselors will take the American Board of Genetic Counseling board exam. So uh, um, in regards to those prerequisites I mentioned earlier, these are some of the things that you may want to start thinking about if you're considering applying to genetic counseling programs. Um, Completing a bachelor's degree is, of course, required, but there's no specific major um, that we focus on for admissions. Typically, something that is scientifically related, like biology, genetics, biochemistry, that's always going to be great. And there are certain courses that are required, like biology and chemistry. Um, 
as well as higher level uh, like social sciences, things like sociology and anthropology. Um, the average GPA for most individuals who apply to genetic counseling programs is a 3.5, uh, but this is not a requirement. Most programs are fairly flexible regarding GPA if individuals have completed all the prerequisites. Uh, this has actually changed fairly recently, but the GRE is actually not required for admission to most genetic counseling programs, though it's good to just check before applying if there's any specific program you're interested in. I can tell you that Baylor um, currently does not require that for the genetic counseling program. And then two of the most important aspects of an individual's application are going to be advocacy experience and shadowing experience. Um, we really want as students who are applying to be as prepared as possible for what it is to be a genetic counselor. So getting as much shadowing experience um, as possible, though we know in this uh, sort of mid-COVID era that it's often difficult to gain in-person shadowing experience. So things like virtual shadowing or interviewing genetic counselors may also be an option. And advocacy experience is really a, a major, major part of our job making sure that you have experience working in situations of crisis. So things like crisis hotlines, peer counseling, um, and hospice care, assisting with individuals who have physical or intellectual disabilities. Um, these are all things that are highly encouraged because many of our patients also experience these difficulties. And so being able to navigate them is an important part of our job. So that's everything that I have prepared for the day. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentations today. Okay. And did the kitty get enough uh, airtime? <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. He uh, he really loves to be on camera. So um, <laughs> that's all right. But yeah. I didn't have him prepare any slides today. So I figured that maybe we shouldn't go off book. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And next up is Juwan Copeland. All right. So hello, everybody. My name is Juwan Copeland. Uh, I'm a third year genetics and genomics, uh, genetics and genomics student here at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, so I'm just going to tell you all about my journey and uh, hopefully, you know, I can inspire others. And because mine definitely was not a straight path at all. Um, and so I started at North Mile High School back in uh, Dayton, Ohio where I was, you know, the average straight A student, you know, I was very happy, so on and so forth, you know. But then I got to Ohio, the Ohio State University because we're the now, we trademark. Um, and, you know, I was very uh, kind of thrown off in college. Like, you know, it's not like under, it's not like uh, high school where, you know, things can just come easy. You don't really have to study. Um, I had to develop proper study habits in order to, you know, increase my GPA because my GPA wasn't the best. And also I became very sick uh, a lot of semesters as well because I have sickle cell anemia and um, it just started to affect my grades. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I had improved my um, GPA, which is something that Dr. Weiss also had uh, mentioned early in his presentation about uh, improving your GPA uh, because they really do like care about that. And that's what I did. And so when I talked to my, one of my mentors, Dr. Venkat Gopalan, um, who was my biochemistry uh, professor, my, my major was biochemistry as well. Um, I told him, you know, my aspirations, I want to go to grad school, I want to help find a cure for sickle cell, this and that. And what he told me was that, you know, you don't have the proper resume right now to apply to graduate school. You know, I, did, I barely had any research experience at all. Um, you know, even though I, I had major improvements in my GPA, it wasn't enough to carry me into the schools such as Baylor, like where I wanted to go. And so he had um, actually suggested that I do what's called a prep program. So a prep program is mainly for uh, underrepresented individuals who are looking to be into a uh, STEM um, secondary school, such as like med school or uh, PhD doctorate training. And so I trained under Dr. Scott Harper at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio where um, I researched ways of optimizing particular microRNAs that would downregulate uh, a gene that was overexpressed in muscular dystrophy called DUX4. And so that gave me the research experience that I needed. Um, and that was my first time I actually, you know, dive, dive deep into what's called gene therapies because gene therapies are my uh, passion uh, for sure. And so with from that, I applied to Baylor and, uh, you know, I got into Baylor College of Medicine um, and I am now in Dr. Andy Groves' lab where I am studying gene therapies for 
uh, trying to ameliorate and also, you know, essentially cure the effects of hearing a, a particular type of hearing loss that 90% uh, of people with hearing loss have. Um, and so in this lab, I am just trying to, you know, again, get a solid foundation in gene therapy, because ultimately what I want to become is a professor um, and a principal investigator, uh, just like how my first mentor, Dr. Scott Harper is. Um, he was a professor for Ohio State University, but his uh, lab was housed at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So exactly like that, um, running my own lab while also being a professor with my lab being based uh, uh, purely, uh, essentially based on finding gene therapies for sickle cell disease. And there has been a lot of work uh, recently that has uh, been published on, you know, uh, finding a cure for sickle cell disease. So hopefully, you know, when I make it to that point, there may not be any need for me to really find a new novel gene therapy. However, there still will be the need of what well, the long-term effects, uh, you know, of patients or uh, other, are there other, you know, particular genes that could be essentially better. Um, so I will be still in the gene therapy field. Uh, if not for sickle cell disease, then for some other genetic disease, because uh, I just love gene therapy and I love, you know, the fact that sickle cell disease has uh, contributed to gene therapy progress because it affects me and my family. Um, that's all I really had, but uh, to end this, I would definitely say, um, if you learn anything from me, it's okay to take a break uh, right after undergrad. You know, uh, I know a lot of people are, especially that was in my position, I was very sad to hear from my mentor, Dr. Kapalan, that, you know, you need to take a year off and get more research experience. And at the time, you know, I didn't really see what the benefits of that was, but um, it definitely made me into the person I am today. And I'm glad that I did do that because not only did I meet a great mentor who writes me uh, outstanding recommendation letters for fellowships and everything like that, talking about Dr. Scott Harper, but it also uh, helped me build my foundation as the scientist that I'm trying to become. Um, and so, you know, even if I didn't get straight A's in undergrad or uh, and I struggled, you know, with my health in undergrad as well, I still made it into Baylor College of Medicine. Um, so really, if you just, you know, work on improving, you put your mind to something, then, you know, anything is possible. Um, and I just, that's all for me. And I'll thank y'all for having me and I'll take it back to you, Dr. Murray. All right. Well, thank you, Juwan. Very inspiring story. Lastly, we have Fatima. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Hi, everyone. And so um, my slides are um, basically blank. So I'm just going to start talking. <laughs> No, no rush with the slides. Um, so uh, my name is Fatima. I'm a third year medical student at Baylor. I um, was going to talk a little bit about um, how uh, you can study genetics as a medical student, um, but I'm also just going to cover, you know, basically how I got here. So I actually went to Houston Baptist University for my undergrad, and I uh, graduated actually a pretty long time ago in 2017. But then I also uh, took a few um, years between undergrad and medical school, and I uh, got a master's in public health. Um, uh, there were like technical difficulties and um, reasons why I couldn't immediately go to med school. But um, uh, yeah, so I actually think I got interested in genetics back in undergrad, probably the first time I took my first genetics course. And I always thought that it was really fascinating. Um, I wasn't really uh, thinking of genetics as a as a career, as a specialty um, before coming to med school because I really didn't know much about it. And I think probably um, a lot of people don't know much about the field just because it's actually very small and uh, very new and um, growing very quickly. Um, so when I started at Baylor, because I was interested, I um, got involved with the genetics and genomics pathway, which we have. And this pathway, um, I recommend it to everybody that I meet, my classmates, everyone, because I just think that it's both very immersive and very, um, it, it trains you really well in genetics, but at the same time, it is very flexible, which works really well with your schedule as a med student. So when I, actually, when I first started doing pathway requirements, I wasn't actually even committed to the pathway. <laughs> it was that flexible. Um, and then as I kept going, I just, I got more interested. I started learning more. Um, 
and uh, eventually I realized that I really liked um, genetics and I might actually do it as a specialty um, in the future. Um, so some of the features of the pathway are that uh, there are some requirements that you have to meet, but you have all four years to do them. There are talks, conferences, seminars, um, these um, events that you have to go to. Uh, there are also preclinical electives and clinical electives that you have to take. And then there's also a research project that you have to complete. The really good thing about all of this is that while it looks like it's so much work, these are things that you would do as a medical student anyways. So um, it's just like a very focused and very structured way to, um, uh, to do that. Sorry, <laughs> distracted by the chat. Um, so these are, you know, the same things, you know, you, you would take some uh, preclinical electives or clinical electives, or you would be involved in research. Um, so it's just a really nice way to combine all of those. Um, we also have a genetics course as uh, preclinical students just for everyone, uh, which I think is uh, really great that we have that at the Baylor because I don't think that that's like a standard part of math school curriculum. And I know that some other math schools actually don't even have that as a separate course. Um, I uh, then did my uh, genetics clinical elective back in February um, as part of the pathway. And so uh, for that elective, you can um, do it in uh, prenatal, a pediatric or um, adult genetics. I did mine um, in pediatric genetics as Texas, at Texas Children's Hospital. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I think that was the experience that really made me start considering genetics as a specialty in the future. Um, I think one of the favorite, one of my favorite things about um, genetics as a career is that it's much more in depth than um, maybe some other specialties. So uh, the number of patients that you would see um, in a day in genetics is actually much fewer, but each patient takes a really long time. Each patient probably takes several hours of um, learning about the patient, everything that ever happened to them since they were born, their families, <laughs> up to three generations, and you um, make a pedigree um, all of the, the conditions that they have, their development, you, you know, just anything that you can think of. And you really get to know your patients super well. And then from there, um, you're just trying to uh, find pieces of this puzzle that you're trying to solve because diagnoses in genetics are um, very precise. And there is probably thousands of them that we know of right now. Um, so each page, it's actually very uh, uncommon for you to walk into a room, see a patient and just, you know, kind of know what's going on with them or have like even a narrow list of differential diagnoses. It's usually very broad and uh, you work with the entire team to solve this puzzle together, which I think is um, really cool and like a, the most enjoyable part of the field for me uh, because everybody starts to, you know, just research <laughs> and it's, it feels like you're learning every single day. It's not something that there is no end to it. And I'm saying that in the best possible way. It's not that you you're done and now your field is really boring because you're not going to see something brand new tomorrow. Um, and the other thing that's really great about uh, genetics as a career, I think is that it's growing so rapidly and it's so new. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities for research and uh, for innovation and just career opportunities in general. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but I think just in general, if you're considering going to medical school or if you're um, uh, you know, considering gen genetics, then becoming a medical geneticist is a, is, a, is a really great career, especially if you don't want to stop learning anytime soon. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Fatima and everyone. So if the attendees could put their questions in the Q&A, then uh, we'll make sure that you get those answered. And also in the chat, Vicky has put the link for the survey. So, uh, Mackenzie asked, are the steps for a medical genetic student the same for those who are studying genetics but aren't going the medical student route? All right, so 
panel is, just come on and take a stab at it. And I think you can read, you can see the same questions, right? Well, I don't, I don't know if, um, as one of the medical people, obviously, I think you've heard a couple of great examples, which is graduate school with regard to um, doing your PhD in genetics or um, genetic counseling. And uh, I think that was really helpful to hear about some of the background requirements for that. I don't know if um, Yuan or Josh or anyone else wants to comment. Mm -hmm. And also the second one, Amaya, for those who also work directly with patients, how much of your day today would you say is working with patients versus working on, and I'm assuming the research? Yeah, sorry, I'll turn my camera back on. So that that's actually a great question. And what I would tell you is it varies all over the place. So for me, I'm your more tip, what, typically what people used to call 80-20, which is that I had originally had 20% of my time for clinic um, and, and, and or teaching. And so I've always had clinic one day a week. Earlier in my career, I actually had clinic two afternoons a week because I had an adult clinic and a pediatric clinic. So that's pretty typical of people to do one or two days of clinic. If you bring in research grants, you know, where the money comes from is important throughout your career. Um, and so if you write grants, that grants not only support the people in your lab, but they also support part of your time. So if you support your time for your research, then you spend that doing research. And then the other time is supported either by clinical care or teaching. There are other geneticists here like Lori Pitaki and, and a number of other geneticists, Shwanadar, who probably do 80% of their time clinical, and then they also do teaching or leadership. So um, it's really variable uh, depending on how much you want research to be part of your time. What tends to be the hardest, although some people do it, is the true sort of 50-50, which is in order to be successful bringing in research grants and writing papers, you have to have enough success and enough time to stay competitive. Um, and so, and if you see patients half the time, a lot of your extra time will be taken up with after clinic calls, following up with families, things like that. So I think most people shift one way or the other, uh, but there are some people that truly do it half and half. And I would say, I would add to that, um, that it will also depend a bit on your, your specialty as yeah. well. Yes. Um, in, yeah, that's a really complicated, <laughs> that is a really complicated question. There's so many iterations of how people do that, but um, things to think about as you are pursuing careers like this is if you have research that you want to do, you know, be thinking about as you're like kind of looking for jobs and programs and like that, how you're going to be able to balance that financial support with research funding versus the clinical amount of clinical you have to do to support your salary as well. And so those are questions that to start thinking about early and start asking around how people are doing that um, because it's easier to ask up front than try to ask later um, <laughs> for those kinds of things. Thank you. And uh, Joshua, would you also give an answer to time commitment and then Abigail and the Enrique question, okay? Yeah, I think like um, what Dr. Plan alluded to is the graduate program that uh, Juwan is in, genetics and genomics here, they do have a separate track. Like if you don't want to necessarily be a classic web bench scientist like myself and you want to go towards more like pure focus computation and human genetics from a PhD, not an MD side, they do have an excellent program here where your coursework is going to be very focused towards um, understanding that and handling big data and doing that kind of computation analysis and building those uh, relationships between pedigrees and trios and novel diseases here. And Baylor also has an excellent um, relationship with the Undiagnosed Disease Network or UDN here for genomics research. 
and they have a great uh, centers here, like um, I think it's I can't remember Dr. Plonk and correct. It's like Mirag or something like that that um, Dr. Lupsky runs and other ones. So like as far as if you're interested in the academic side of uh, genetics research, it's an excellent institution here for that and great graduate training if you want to be on that side of it, not necessarily on the patient side. And a lot of those labs are also run by physician scientists like um, Dr. Plon, Dr. Adams, where they're going to be bringing that clinical expertise to basically help the PhD students understand and appreciate the diseases and the complexities of that system. But as far as from a pure PhD side, yeah, you've she hit it out of the park. It's, it matters where the money comes from and you got to run the lab and it's a, definitely a big burden to do that. So from my side, I can't even imagine like having clinical obligations because it's so demanding, not even thinking about family and teaching and other service that you have to do. So it's, it's definitely, you've got to have the passion, like for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I can answer the question that Enrique posed. Um, as far as if genetic counselors can design and conduct our own experiments, um, we certainly can serve as primary investigators for research projects. Um, we also can, um, you know, write grants and uh, submit for IRB approval and all of the things that you would expect within a research role is something that we're trained to do in our graduate programs. Currently, um, I'm actually functioning in a research coordinator role for a study. And so for me, I like that research doesn't always have to be something that's sort of happening behind the scenes away from patients. Um, I really enjoy the aspect where I'm able to sort of consent patients and speak with them directly about how the research can impact them and others. Um, so there's a lot of variety, and I think the way that we can participate in research, either in sort of the more investigative role or in that patient-facing role. Thank you. And please answer uh, the survey for us. We really appreciate the feedback so we can improve these offerings. And I saw some raised hands, but I can't see them. Are there still raised hands? And if you have the ability to come on, would you just come on and ask or type it in the Q&A? Uh oh, here we go. Any advice for submitting a competitive PhD application? Great talk, thank you all. Well, I've interviewed for genetics program for a long time. Um, I, I think actually Joshua summed it up well. People care about your undergraduate GPA, but if it's not as great as you'd like, then just be honest about it. Just explain why. I have a, I won't name him, but I have a graduate student in my lab that did not have a great undergraduate GPA. He actually went and got a master's and did well at that and then worked actually for a biotech company. And I think the graduate program really looked much more at his biotech experience in a genomic, you know, a genomics company and his master's than his undergraduate. So um, I, I do think they look for, I was just talking to one of my students, uh, summer students who's thinking of applying in genetics, and they will tell you how much research on average they expect. So that's useful. Look on websites, find out what graduate programs say. Um, a lot of them do like you to have done one long-term project, <clears throat> either, you know, a couple of semesters at your college or after you graduate. So she, for example, is at a small school that doesn't offer any research at college. And so she was thinking she may need to take a gap year to be competitive. Um, but the websites really have a lot of information. Don't shy away from looking at them. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say like there's other opportunities like you know, um, if you are at one of those small schools and you've been fortunate enough to do like what Juwan's done, like a smart program fellowship or something like that, but you don't necessarily want um, to delay, you might be able to contact like your mentor who you've done your summer study with and maybe be able to analyze data at home or to do computational or informatics or to write a, you know, a review of the state of the field or something that can take you like six months slowly. So you can do those things to kind of bolster your resume to make it more holistic. So you can have those other experiences that 
can you know outweigh the uh lower gpa like i myself had that um my first two years were not great i was definitely too focused on the wrong things <laughs> but if you're seeing an upward trajectory each year that helps if you have research experience that helps and also if you write your application to why that program right not just like a blanket one but what is it specifically about that program and what faculty you can see yourself working with that carries a lot of weight because then we know as admissions committee that you're serious about here and what you want to do so not just a generic oh i'm really interested in research but what is it about you right like if Juwan had written one about gene therapy and sickle cell and how close it is to his family and his heart, like that's a big motivator. And as an app, like a reviewer, you understand, you read it, and you're like, okay, I get a picture of who this person is. And that can carry a lot of weight to really make it personal about you and why the program is a good fit for you. Um, and try and get those experiences however you can, because we see those, right? I mean, we definitely can appreciate the effort that you all put into it. I just want to add something quick as well. Um, I think that me meeting people in person at conferences also played a significant role because once, and I had, you know, my, I had business cards with my name. I had, you know, my resume, I stapled them and was giving them to prospective schools I wanted to go to. And, uh, you know, I kind of have like a charismatic personality. So I was hoping that they remember like who I am. And I also sent follow-up emails and they did. Um, and I also just want to uh, throw this, on to the plate as well for applying to graduate schools. I applied to about 15 schools, um, really only because, well, for one, a lot of these schools have application waivers. So definitely don't shy away from even asking them about, you know, if you can get some sort of waived fee for these, because I barely paid, I paid for maybe like two applications. And for number two, um, if you want to just travel somewhere, apply you know, you think like California, I applied to a California school just because I want to see what California is like. This is the time, that'll be the time that you really want to, um, if you want to go somewhere, try to explore somewhere, apply to a school that's in that area because for the most part, um, if you make it past, you know, be, looking good on paper, they're going to fly you out there. So you're going to get experience, you know, with being in that city, with being at that school. Um, and so I definitely took that as a chance to do a lot of my traveling. I never traveled that much um, before, but like while until I applied to a bunch of grad schools. So just something to put out there, you know, but also just be mindful of application waivers. Don't, you know, you don't know unless you ask. So just like how Dr. White had also said in his presentation. So mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Please ask them. They do have them. We thank you for joining us. Please fill out the survey. And we also try to keep our um, offerings for an hour so you can come back, so you can spread the word. And people, they don't hold you too long. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, the panelists and the attendees. I saw that we had 50 people at the height, I believe. So this is a great turnout. So thank you so much. Have a good